We're going to jump right into our message. As I said a moment ago, we're going to talk this weekend from the scriptural point of view. If you have a Bible and you go to Hebrews chapter 11, there should be a little heading right on top that says the hall of faith. And so we believe faith is an important part. So think about hall of fame. Hall of fame this weekend um, that's already happened. They've enshrined some different players, sometimes coaches, owners into the hall of fame. And all it's saying is this, if you're not a football fan, you probably could care less, but it's saying these players were outstanding. These players, they made a definite mark in the NFL. So think about it, like who's your favorite player if you're a football person? You probably have someone. Now you probably think my, my players are just Steelers, but I grew up in an era where there were some running backs that were sort of my, like a guy by the name of Walter Payton. Some of you probably know who that is, right? That was an amazing running back. Herschel Walker, Tony Dorsett. So I watched teams for the running backs, and then I, I, I also watched the Steelers. And of course, Jerome Bettis, and of course, Franco Harris, and of course, Rocky Blyer. And the list goes on, six Super Bowls, I believe. But anyway, um, <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11. So these guys were enshrined because of their greatness in football. Hebrews chapter 11 has some people enshrined for their greatness in God. And that's what I want to talk to you about. They put their faith in God and it literally changed the direction of their life. And I want to encourage you as you hear this message today, you might've heard about faith before. In fact, when I, when I start talking about faith, I think everybody has different ideas about what you think faith is. And so I want to I want to just hit it from a point of view that maybe you've not thought about before. And I want to start in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 simply because it tells us some things about faith that are important. It says in verse 1 now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. Here's something interesting about faith. When you think about faith, there is not just one aspect of it. In fact, I would say it this way, faith is multifaceted. It's not just one one thing. Faith is this, and that's it. In order to receive God's grace into your life, you must, by faith, through grace, receive Jesus as your Savior. That's the beginning part of faith. But here's the thing about faith. It doesn't end there. In Colossians, the Bible says, in the same way you received him, walk in him. Well, I received him by believing in my heart and saying something with my mouth. Well, now he says, that's the way you're going to walk your life. You're going to have to believe at times in your heart, and you're going to have to say some things with your mouth. Now, people have called it fanatical. You might be visiting our church and saying, see, I told you they were fanatics. Well, Jesus actually is the one that taught that whole principle. If you went, you don't have to now, to Mark chapter 11, Jesus literally said there's something with believing in your heart and saying something with your mouth. Salvation begins with that, but then our walk with God is how we continue the journey with that. We're going to talk about that today, talk about how that looks. But check out verse 1 out of the Amplified. It says this. It says, now faith is the assurance, the confirmation. Amplified is going to expand words from the Greek language. It says the title deed. I like this. Faith is the title deed. If I gave you the title deed to my house or my car or whatever I own, and I said, here's the title deed, you can have it, it's yours. Like you don't ever have to come back to me and ask. I just gave it to you. It's yours. God said, faith is a title deed. Faith says it's mine. When everything in the world says it, it's not yours. Faith says it's mine. But I, let, me, let me say this before I read on. Has people pushed faith to the extreme sometimes? Here's what my spiritual father used to teach us as young people, young preachers. He said, every Bible truth or doctrine that you'll find in the Bible, because faith is a doctrine for all of you that don't know, Hebrews chapter six, verses one and two has six basic doctrines. I have a little series that we're gonna be doing on that sometime, I don't, don't know when, but um, faith is one of the doctrines. So, so that means this, it's something that's very important in your life and to God. So here's what he told us. Every doctrine in the Bible can be pushed to the extreme, to one side in the ditch, to the other side in a ditch. And he told us as young preachers, Stay in the middle of the road. So I've tried my whole life as a pastor and someone who's pastored this church now for 30 plus years, I've always, I've tried to stay in the middle of the road and not be extreme on either side. 
Are y'all with me? Now you might be here and say, no, man, we need to be extreme. Jesus was extreme. Jesus was a person of faith and everything he did was out of faith. But I will tell you this, he wasn't as weird as some people act in um, Christianity today. Like he seemed pretty normal. There were some things that we we're like, wow, that's, that's pretty crazy that he did. But Jesus had something backing him up when he did it. When you do it, if you don't have anything backing you up, it just seems weird. Amen. He says, the title deed of things we hoped for being the proof of things we do not see and the conviction of their reality. Faith perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. So let's stop. Back years ago, there was a pastor that I followed. Um, he's now gone home to be with the Lord. His name was Pastor John Osteen in Houston, Texas. His son now, Joel, pastors the church. But John Osteen, back years ago, used to say this. We have five senses that we live by naturally, but there's a sixth sense, and it's how we live spiritually, and that's by faith. So by faith, there are times, everything in the world can be as crazy as can be, but by faith, we can trust God. And we can trust that God's promises are true, that he'll take care of you even when the world's going in the crazy directions that it can be going in. How many are thankful that God can take care of you no matter what, right? So verse two says, for by this faith, our ancestors were approved. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. I want you to get a hold of this. Where you are sitting today, whether it's here, whether it's home, whether it's at Fairlawn, your seats were made from a place, a realm that is not visible. Now, I know you might think, no, our seats were made at some manufacturing company. They were, but what, what they were made from, everything got its start in him. So when you think about this, there's an invisible realm right now that you can't see. That's where God's realm is. Everything in that realm that we need can be pulled into this realm to help you no matter what you, if your heart is hurting, if your life is hurting, if, if whatever's going on, you can pull things from one realm to another realm. Amen. So the word of God, by faith, produced everything that we see in this realm right now. Verse four. Now he's gonna start listing some of these people. Listen, by faith, Abel. This is, you know this if you've studied scripture. Cain and, Cain and Abel, the first two children of Adam and Eve. Cain and Abel. So but who's noticed, who's first listed? Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was approved as righteous man because God approved his gifts. And even though he is dead, he still speaks through his faith. Let's just say this real quick. Don't ever be fooled to think that when someone dies, that they still can't have something that's still speaking in the planet right now. I know some great men and women of God that have died since I started preaching back in the day years ago. And now they've gone home to be with the Lord. But you know what? Their life is still speaking not because they're on YouTube, not because of any of that. Their life is speaking because they impacted other people's lives. And those people are speaking still. So their lives are affecting other people's lives. Are y'all with me? Verse five, by faith, Enoch was taken away. And so he did not experience death. For all of you that never heard it before, Enoch was one day, and then it says, and then he was not. God just took him right off the planet. And the Bible says that happened as we read on he was not being able to be found because God took him away. For before he was taken away, he was approved as one who pleased God. Now, here's something about faith that I want you to jot down if you're taking notes. Faith is the only way you and I can please God. So scripture never says this. Love is the only way you can please God. God wants us to love. It's part of the nature that he wants us to have. But he never says without love, it's impossible to please God. But check out this next verse. Verse six says, now faith or other translations, but without faith, it's impossible to please God. So here's how it works. The day that I received Christ, I did that by faith. I'm receiving grace, the salvation gift that he gave by faith. The day that I do that, I'm pleasing God. But it doesn't stop there. The rest of your life, faith is going to affect your life. Check this out. It's impossible to please God without faith since the one who comes near or draws near to God must believe that God exists and he re rewards those who seek him. 
How many here, if you've received Christ, if you didn't, we're gonna give you an opportunity in a moment. But if you're here and you say, I've received Christ, how many believe that he is? Like, I I don't ever doubt that God is not. He is, I know that. How many believe that when you seek him, he'll reward you? We all all believe that. So if you're taking notes down, we sang a song just a moment ago and it had that word, it kept, kept on saying, I believe, I believe. It kept on saying that. That's what faith, faith is, I believe. In fact, if you take notes and jot this down, in fact, all of our notes are available. And I found out after last night's worship experience, I will not be going through all the notes um, that I have. So you'll have them, you can go home and look at them, but at least you'll have some of them. But here's the definition of faith that's in our notes. And they'll put up a QR code on the screen if you wanna grab that and, and grab our notes. Faith in its simplest form is defined as our belief or our trust in God. So you'll find these kind of scriptures in the Bible. We're not gonna go to them now. We walk by faith and not by sight. So John Osteen, when he used to talk about, we have five senses, we can feel, we can touch, we can smell, all of those senses. Faith is something different. Faith doesn't go by what I can feel, what I can smell, what I can see. Faith goes by what God said. God's word will override anything in your life if you allow it to, no matter what the world has told you. So we walk by faith, not by sight. Other places say the just shall live by faith. So if you're taking notes, this will not be in notes or on a screen, but I want you to write it down. Faith should influence how you live your life. Faith in God should influence now how you live for God. Let me put it to you in a couple practical ways. All, you, all of you guys here that are younger, anyone in the room that's younger, but these guys are sitting up here because they're awesome. Um, I love it that they're sitting up front, taking notes. I think that's amazing. But when faith starts to influence your life, it might start to change who you date. It might change how a boy should be treating a girl or a girl should be treating a boy. All of a sudden it changes. It starts to influence you. And even though we live in a world that right now people are saying, um, you know, I'm not sure of my identity. It's a big deal right now. Um, I want you to hear something. God's sure about it. God's sure. God's sure about your identity. Here's the problem with our culture. We got so far away from God that faith in God no longer influences what we think about how we live. So let me give you a practical way. That was all for free. Here's a practical way. Before I received Christ, I had no faith influencing my life. So many of you have heard the story. I don't want to bore you with this, but I just want to sort of set you up to give you an example of how this works. Faith changed the way that I live. It changed how, it influenced my life to live a different way. When I, when I put my faith in God, when I put my faith in Jesus, it changed the way I live. It influenced me differently. So when I was 17 years old, my brother David was 21 years old and he drowned, he died. So we had seven boys, for all of you that don't know, in our family, seven boys in an Italian family, you know this, close-knit family. And one of our brothers dies, he drowns. He had epilepsy, grand mal seizures, was left in, in near, near water and somehow fell in and ended up drowning. I took that, I, was not, I did not know Jesus. We went to a religious church, but I did not know Jesus. No personal relationship. I'm talking about how faith will change. It, it influences you to act different. So my brother died and I did probably what any 17 year old would do. I was mad and I was angry. So I, I mean, seriously, my, my dad, I think, I think my dad got so tired of being called to the principal's office, to the school. Your son's sitting here. I mean, the craziest stuff you would ever imagine. I'm not going to get into what it was, but my dad was so mad. He's like, what's wrong with you? You know, I didn't know what was wrong. I was angry. I don't know who I was angry with. I was angry at people. I didn't know to be religious like everyone who's religious gets angry at God. I didn't know that. I was brought up in a religion that I didn't even think that God had anything to do with that. I just was mad at people. So fast forward just a little bit, and my, I, I think my mom had a nervous breakdown, by the way. One of her boys died, 
And I think she had a nervous breakdown now that I look back at it, what I know now. And one day, someone delivers to my family pictures of my brother David a week before he died at a singles meeting where he actually died the next week there, where he was in a crowd of people, his hands, where he was accepting Christ as a savior. Now, let me, let me say, tell you what happened. I had accepted Christ by then. And when I found out he accepted Christ, it changed everything. My mom became a whole different person. Why? Because it starts to influence you to think different and act different. We found 1 Thessalonians in the Bible where it says, don't grieve like those who have no hope. Oh, wait, we have hope? Yeah, it says we're going to see whoever it is that you have had transition to heaven. During COVID, during these last couple years, recently, you're going to see him again. So fast forward a little bit more to five years ago in 2017. My mom dies in January. My dad dies in August. I mean, we were like, what is going on? So that all happens. And my brother Joe, who's a pastor in Warren, Ohio, he'll be preaching here in September. I told you about that. He's amazing. Um, my brother Joe called me one day and he said, hey, do you feel numb? I was like, is this a quick, uh, like a, a trick question? <laughs> Yeah, I do. I feel numb. For all of you that have ever lost a loved one, you know how you feel. Like, you feel like, is this happening? Am I in a dream? Is this weird? Like, it's like weird. And I was like, yeah. And we started talking. He's like, thank God we know where they're at and we're going to see them. And I was like, yes. Here's what I want you to know. Faith will not get rid of sometimes the feelings you have of going through something. But faith will get you through whatever it is that you are going through. You want to hear something? This is the wildest thing, and I think it's worth for someone to hear this. You know how sometimes you become a Christian and you start thinking about grandma, grandpa, aunts and uncles. Are they going to be in heaven? I don't know if anyone ever told them. We had a grandpa in the early 70s. We were not Christians at the time. We did not know Jesus. And in the early 70s, he was living in California, and my dad got a phone call that he was on his deathbed. So my dad went like any son would. He flew out to California, went to see my grandpa, and he, and he dies just not long after that. And then a little nurse comes out and says, I just want to let you know, Mr. Caminetti, I, I, I just prayed with your dad to receive Christ before he took his last breath, and he received Christ. Now, think about this. Years later, we all come to Christ, and my, my dad remembers that story. I had this little nurse that said, Grandpa accepted Christ into his heart. I didn't know what he meant back, she meant back then. We just had a nurse here at Faith Family that did the exact same thing two days ago to an individual who was dying in the hospital where everyone left and she snuck in that room and I'm not gonna tell you where and I'm not gonna tell you who because there is some crazy person that's like, well, they should, they should be in trouble for that. Are we not thankful that there's a nurse that actually went in and told someone about Christ? I'm thankful for that. My grandpa, my brother, I, I have um, my grandmother say, all received Christ before they died. Guys, we're not to grieve like those that have no hope. It changed. Why I told you all those stories is not to take up time. First of all, I felt like someone needs to hear them. First of all, second of all, I, it changed how I responded because now faith influenced me a different way. I'm not mad that my mom and dad are in heaven. I'm not mad that they transitioned out. And some people that are people of faith that um, are, they'll say, well, why didn't, you, why didn't you raise him from the dead? Why don't you do that? <laughs> right? Raising someone from the dead takes three gifts of the spirit to be in operation. And they're in operation by the spirit as he wills. You can't make them happen. So, you know, if you're going to walk in a room and say, I'm going to raise someone up from the dead, good, 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 good. Start pulling everybody out you can. That is awesome. But the truth of the matter is, when someone transitions to heaven, unless the Lord does something miraculously, you're going to see them in heaven. But just remember this, the last breath someone takes on earth is their first breath they take in heaven. And that is an amazing breath. I can guarantee you that. All right, well, I better move on. So let's talk about how faith influenced my life, how it can influence your life, and what scripture says about how faith can influence our life. If you're jotting these down, I would encourage you to 
follow along in our notes if you can do that. Faith is the only means of salvation. Faith, Ephesians chapter two, verse eight says, it's by faith through grace that you are saved. Listen, not by works, lest someone would boast. So if I could be saved by my works, I could say, I did that. I was a good person. I did works that got me to heaven. But you remember that guy that we saw just a moment ago by the name of Abel? And it says his sacrifice was accepted and Cain's wasn't. Abel offered up a sacrifice by faith that he offered the right kind of sacrifice to God. Cain offered something that came from his flesh, works. Cain's was not acceptable and Abel's was. Listen closely. You cannot get to heaven ever by the works that you do. Right? It's only by receiving Christ. So if you're here and you're like, man, I'm not good enough. No kidding, none of us are. I'm not good enough yet. I got to get better. Why? He accepts you just like you are. That's how, this is how this works. You just receive Christ and he'll accept you just like you are. Second thing, Jesus is the object of saving faith. And there's scriptures for each one of these. If you want to write those down, you can. Jesus is the object. Listen closely, guys. There are so many things in the culture that we live in right now that are telling us that can get you to heaven. And so if you are a college student or about to start college, you need to know and be aware that they're gonna tell you some things that are completely opposite than the Bible. You are gonna have some professors. I remember back when I was growing up, back in the 1970s, there was a a movie out with Jerry Lewis called The Nutty Professor. How about this? Please don't be a nutty professor to your students where you're telling them there is no God, there is no Jesus, all of the stuff that people do. Let's, let, if you are a part of faith family and you're a professor, how about if you stand for Jesus Christ and not be like the world is that's telling people, hey, there, there might not be a God. And I want, I want you to know if you are a student and you're part of faith family, you're gonna be tested in these areas. Can I encourage you? Stand on what God says. I don't care if the professor tells you, I don't want you in my class anymore. It's like, all right, out. But stand for Christ, not for what they're going to tell you that don't believe this Bible. The world has done that for so long. We have a group, a generation of people right now that are trying to run our country without God. And that's why we were going in the direction that we are. So faith is the object, right? Jesus is the object of saving faith. Faith shows itself through work. Through work. So listen closely. Works can't get you to heaven. But once you accept Christ, you will have good works coming out of you. So, you know, helping a lady across the street, little old lady, putting your jacket down so she can walk on it instead of the water, all that, all that stuff that people have in their mind, not getting you to heaven. It's nice that you're kind, but that won't get you to heaven. What will get you to heaven is believing in your heart that Jesus Christ died, he went to hell, and he is now your Lord and Savior. And you say that out of your mouth. The Bible says you'll be saved. We're going to give you in a moment, to, in a, moment to, a chance to do that. But um, you start to have good works once you accept Christ. You start to do good things towards others once you accept Christ. Jotty notes down, faith produces peace. And of course, like I said, there's scriptures, and there's more than one for every one of these. But let me say this to you. We live in such a bizarre time right now, right? For all of you that are new to church and you're like, this is all new to me. What's going on in the world right now is a setup for the return of Jesus Christ to the planet. There is just no doubt about it. So with that being said, let me make a little plug real quickly. Next week, I'm gonna be talking to you about some stuff that I feel like the Lord laid on my heart to teach on next weekend concerning what's going on in this world right now that we live in. Back, back um, when 2020 hit, all the craziness that hit with 2020, the Lord spoke something to my heart as we were journeying through 2020. Because you remember, there were race wars going on, they're still going on, all kind of craziness going on. And I'm not, I'm not acting like none of that. It is true, there's stuff going on, there's no doubt about it. But here's what the Lord spoke to my heart. Teach people this is not home. This is not home. So you want to act like this is home? Then you're going to act just like the people that call this home. Or 
You can be salt and light, like the Bible says that we should be, and you can start proclaiming things that God says instead of acting just like the world that you live in. He said, tell them this is not home. So I did do that. I did my best that I could through that year and then the next year where I always was talking about it. Why? Because faith produces peace. And when I am tied up and entangled with what's going on in this world, I have no peace. So all this junk that's going on in the world, bombarding us constantly, I, you will not have peace. You want some peace? Faith in God, faith in what his word says is the only way you can grab peace in your life. But check this out, and we're gonna talk more about this next weekend. Lack of faith leads to falling away from God. You know how people, you might not know this, but this is happening all over in our world that we live in. But a lot of people now are saying this, I'm gonna deconstruct my faith. You know, they're trying to go back. Do they really believe what they say they believe? Do we really believe all this stuff is true in the Bible? For all of you that don't know, I, I was, you think about it, Italian family, I was raised in the Catholic church. In the fifth grade, a Catholic priest came into our class and we were allowed to ask any question that we wanted to. Well, in fifth grade, just for all of you that don't know my kind of life that I was, my teacher all of a sudden disappeared in fifth grade. Her name was Miss, Mrs. Kipper. And the principal, Sister Mary Edwarden, had me come to her office and said this to me. You're the reason why she's not here anymore. You are a horrible kid. I was like, peace. I'm glad. That's how I felt back then. And um, <laughs> so I thought I'm going to ask the priest some questions. So the priest comes in and I said, hey, is this Bible true? I thought, man, I'm, I'm going to get him in. I said, is this Bible really true? He goes, oh, no, most of those stories in there are just stories. And so we have a generation of young people that have now become older people, and that's actually what they believe. These are just some good stories. These aren't good stories. The, the Bible says it's living, it's breathing. The Bible is real. This is not a story that, uh, this is a good story, like try to, try to apply this to your life. It's a good story. No, it's life, this will change your life. And how you are influenced in life by this book will change how your walk is. You will not be the same that you were before. Yes, as a fifth grader, I was an idiot. No doubt about it. I had so many issues, it was pitiful. On top of it all, I had ADD and I was just always looking. I, I was just somewhere all the time, just not paying attention. And teachers hated it. They were like, what's wrong with you? And no one actually knew what ADD was back then. I've grown out of it. Thank God. I think. My wife might tell you totally different. Here, if you're jotting down notes, please write this down because this is gonna lead us into what we're gonna do here in a moment. Faith activates God's power. Faith activates God's power. Faith in God and faith in his word activates his power. And if you're jotting notes down, jot this down. Faith doesn't have to see something to believe it. How many here have ever heard that, this, this phrase, doubting Thomas? Anyone here ever heard? Right? Don't be a doubting Thomas. You hear people say it all the time. Well, doubting Thomas is found in John's gospel, chapter 20. Jesus comes and appears to all the disciples. And Thomas isn't in the room. So the disciples tell Thomas, we just saw the Lord. He came in. We saw, we saw where the nails were in his hand. We saw where his side had a sword put in. We saw Jesus. He's like, I will not believe unless I can see so I want you to see something that Jesus does for all of you, that you, if someone ever told you something like that, that you would get down on them. Jesus walked in the room while that was going on, and Jesus said, Peter, put your finger right here. He put it in. He said, put it in my side. You wanted to put your hand in my side? There it is. He said, just believe. Stop doubting. And then he said this to him. He said, you believe because you've seen Blessed are those who believe and have never seen. That's you and I. We just believe by faith, right? We believe that God is real because of him saying in his word. But faith starts to see things differently. Faith doesn't go by just what it senses or what it feels. Faith goes by something different. It goes by what God said about us. So I wanna do something 
I'm going to give you a quote real quickly. And then, because there, there are a bunch of people, and I'll tell you this real quickly. There are a bunch of people, in fact, at least 16 people listed in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. 16 people that their lives were changed because they put their faith in God. And they can put the list up. There's a bunch of them. I'm not going to go over every one of them, but Abel, the one that we talked about, Enoch, we read about him, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, all of those. You, you can check those out. But they all believed God and walked by faith. And the Bible says, but none of them ever received their inheritance, what they were actually living for, because Jesus hadn't yet come. You and I, we now have an ability by living by faith and walking by faith to receive Jesus now. They never had that. So I want you to jot down this little quote. I think it's, it's a great quote for what we're talking about. When your story connects to God's story, it leads to a greater story. When your story connects, think about that, connects to God's story, it leads to a greater story. So when I think about the Caminetti family and I think about seven boys, my mom and dad, my mom came from Italy when she was 13 years old. My dad was born in Springfield, Ohio. My mom lived in Warren, Pennsylvania. My dad lived in Springfield, Ohio. Some somehow, some way, they came together to a wedding in Kane, Pennsylvania, of all places. They met each other there, liked each other, and they wound up marrying each other and wound up in Warren, Ohio. Catholic as you can get. My dad never knew Christ and was an alcoholic like you would not believe. For all of you that don't understand Italian families, my dad made wine. He had these gigantic barrels in our basement and a wine cellar that he built. He drank all of that wine sometimes in six months. And he'd have to go buy wine. My mom's like, why are you having to buy wine? Well, I drank all that stuff that was down there. He was always drinking. I was raised in a family that had a dad that was an alcoholic. There were times my mom and dad got in fights where you would hear it as a young kid and it would just grip your heart because my mom was saying, you just need to leave. She's yelling at him. He's outside drunk with the neighbor. I mean, just crazy stuff happening. And one day, my dad's story of life connected with God's story. That alcoholic smoking three packs of cigarettes a day and bragging about it, his story connected with God's story. If my dad's story could connect, your story could. My, when I think about my dad, my mom, we always would say this about my, my mom. She's like a saint. I don't think my mom ever did anything wrong. I used to laugh because if you're a Catholic, you know this. You go into a confessional booth and, you, and here's what you do. Um, Father, for I've sinned, it's been three months to my last confession. Mine would be like longer than that. But you were supposed to go in there to get your sins forgiven. Now, for all of you that are former Catholics or you're still Catholic now, I'm not, I'm not mad at you. I'm not against you. But that's not how it works. I don't have to go to a man to get my sins forgiven. I need to go to God to get my sins forgiven. So my dad's story intersected with God's story, and the story became a different story because he connected with God. So here's what I know. I know that when Scripture tells us that faith will start to influence our lives. My dad started telling everybody at his workplace, he worked at Packard Electric as a tool and die guy for years in Warren, Ohio. My dad started telling everyone there about Jesus. Everywhere my dad went, he had this Catholic, we would call him a track, but it was how a Catholic could be saved. He gave it to every Catholic he knew. Everyone he knew. Every, I'd be like, dad, I gotta give them out. I just gotta give these, these people don't know. I just gotta give them out. What happened? This guy who was an alcoholic, who smoked three packs of cigarettes a day, all of a sudden his life changed and was influenced by God. And he thought it was important to tell other people about it. My question to you is, when will it become important enough in your life that your story now is intersected with God's story and you start telling people about what God did in your life? If my dad could do it, you can do it. But here's what I want to close up with. On Wednesday night this past week, we had First Wednesday. And you know what happened? God came in and people were healed. It was an amazing, amazing worship experience. And since we're talking about faith, 
I want to show you something in James real quickly, and then we're going to close this up. James, you all still with me? James chapter 5, verse 13. Is any among you suffering? The Greek word is philipsis, and it means the pressure of life is on. Let me ask you this question. Anyone here feel like that's going on in your life? It's just like the pressure of life is on. What should you do? Post. Oh, you should pray. Sometimes I read like weird words. You should pray. Who should pray? I should go to someone and ask them to pray for me. I'm going through a tough time. No? Oh, that's great. But he said, you should pray. Is any among you cheerful? You should sing praises. Is any among you sick? He should call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now watch the verse 15 is the one I want. The prayer of faith. Everyone say the prayer of faith. Notice what it never says in the Bible, the prayer of doubt. It never says in the Bible, the prayer of doubt and unbelief. That's not going to do you any good, right? He says a prayer of faith. What's the prayer of faith going to do? The prayer of faith will save the sick person. The word save there in the Greek language literally means to restore, to heal, to raise back up. He said the prayer of faith, not the prayer of doubt, the prayer of faith. Check it out. It will raise him up and watch this. If he committed sins, he will be forgiven. You know what the biggest thing for most people? They think they did something wrong and that's why they're sick. I did something wrong. I deserve what I have. Can I please tell you this? You don't deserve any of that. Jesus took it. You don't, you don't get it as your punishment. Jesus took punishment so you don't have to. So if you're here and you're sick, because this is on my heart as we got ready for this weekend, that I need to go ahead and pray for people this weekend that either need physical healing or mental healing. He says the Lord will raise them up if they committed sins, they will be forgiven. I I want you to know that right now, your story right now can connect to God's story. In a moment, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to ask Christ to come into your life. But before we do that, I wanna take a moment and we're gonna sing a song, but we're gonna do something totally different that we don't normally do. One of the reasons why we don't normally do this is because our church is so gigantic. So it can't be the way that we used to do it maybe back in the day. But then on the other hand, I'm like, Lord, what what can I do here today that I wanna follow your plan? So we're gonna sing this song. And this song that we're going to sing, we, we, our team wrote this song. It's called The Way. For all of you that don't know it, you can go on any um, music platform and grab it, on YouTube and grab it. But it talks about, I believe, that's faith, right? I believe. When we talk about faith, I believe you are the God of miracles. Can I ask you a question? How many here believe that God is the God of miracles? Yeah, all of us. I think people that don't even know God believe that. They're like, yeah, he's, he's a God of miracles. In your name, anything is possible. Jesus said all things are possible to him that believes. So here's what we're going to do. Way out of the box for what we normally would do here on a weekend. But I feel like this is the way the Lord said to do it this weekend, so I'm going to do it. I'm going to have you stand in a moment. We're going to sing this song. While we're singing this song, if you need healing, I want you to come and just stand here. Don't be afraid. Nothing weird is going to happen. We're not going to do anything weird, like not a magic formula. None of this kind of... I just want you to come if you need healing physically or mentally. While we're singing this song, I'm gonna ask you to just come down front and just stand here. And you don't have to be just one. You can, you can stack people back if you're helping out to do this part of our team. So let's stand. And if you need a touch from God right now for your body physically or mentally, I'm gonna ask you to come down here while we're singing this song. believe you're the God of miracles in your name anything is possible the holy healer indivisible I've seen you make a way you are the way I believe you're the
Eyes closed just for a moment. I'm gonna pray for you here in a moment. But before anything else, I'm gonna give this opportunity. If you're here and you don't know Jesus, everything starts right there. So his eyes are closed just for one moment before we pray over those that are here. If you were to die, where will you go? Where do you spend eternity? There are only two places. There's not a third or a fourth there's heaven, there's hell. Hell was not created for mankind. Hell was created for the devil and those that were thrown out of heaven, um, the angels that were thrown out because they followed Satan. Hell wasn't created for you. So God created heaven for us. As eyes are closed just for a moment, if you're here and you say, Pastor, I've never received Christ, but I'd like to. I need Jesus in my life. I want to know for sure that my story is going to intersect and connect with his story. His eyes are closed just for one moment. If you're here and you've never received Christ or you're here and you did it one time, but you need to recommit right now, eyes are closed. Let's pray this out loud. Everyone from their heart, I want you to say this out loud. Ready? Repeat it after me. Everyone that hears my voice. Oh God, I believe Jesus died for me. I repent of my sins and I ask Jesus to come into my heart I thank you now that I'm born again and I thank you that I will spend eternity with you in heaven in Jesus name amen eyes are closed if you just prayed that prayer and said I just received Christ or pastor I didn't just receive Christ I recommitted my life to Christ because somehow some way I got away from God So I just recommitted my life to God. If you just prayed that prayer and received Christ or recommitted, would you do me a favor? Shoot your hand up right now in the air. Just say, I just prayed that prayer. I wanna see them all over the room. Man, that is an amazing sight. So many hands are going up. Let's give it up for all of them. Thank you, that is amazing. That is amazing. 
Hey, faith is in the house. I can sense it. So I'm going to pray. But I want to do this a little bit different. And uh, so I can't, my, my spiritual father used to say this, I can't heal anyone. I'm not the healer. Jesus is the healer. My spiritual father used to say this, sometimes God will do a wholesale healing event. In other words, you might not get to every single person individually, but he'll just, all of them. And so we're believing God that he'll do that today. But I wanna do it a little bit different. Hey, Mark, I wanna ask you, I want you to get over here. I'm gonna, I, want, I want to actually put my hands on you. So get up closer. And then here's what I wanna do. I want everyone to join hands with someone that is here. I'm not talking about in the congregation, but anyone up front, would you join hands with the people? I'm gonna lay hands on Mark. And we're gonna believe that that same healing power just goes into everybody as we pray. Y'all good? Because this is the way that we feel directed to do it right here, right now. So I'm not the healer, but Jesus is. The Bible says these hands, these signs will follow those who believe. They will lay hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. So we're gonna lay hands. If you're new to all this, I just wanna let you know this. There is a real God who has a real heart for people, who cares about people. So no matter where you're at, join hands with someone right now, up here, not in the congregation, up here. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for your healing power. And right now I put my hands on Mark and I thank you that your healing power goes from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. We release the healing anointing we curse anything on his body that doesn't belong. We command every cell in his body to function properly. We command his blood to function properly. And we thank you now in the name of Jesus. Every person who's in line, they now get to experience that same healing power that's going into his body. It goes into their bodies. We call each person healed. We call each person whole in Jesus' name. We thank you the anointing breaks yokes, destroys burdens. I thank you now that the anointing is setting every person free. We thank you the anointing is working in every person's body. We command sickness to go and we speak life. We call life into each person's body. Whether they're hurting physically or mentally, I thank you now the healing power of God goes into their bodies. Father, just as scripture tells us to do, we're now gonna rejoice. So let's all together, let's all together, let's give God a shout. Come on, let's praise him. Father, we magnify you. Thank you that your healing power is working. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Now, if I can instruct all of you that were here, there is something I think that you could do that will help you. Tomorrow when you get up, today when you think about it, the next day, Father, I thank you. When pastor prayed, the healing power of God is working in my body. The healing power of God is working in my body. Every time you think about it, every time you feel a pain, the healing power of God is working in my body. We're not saying try to ignore anything. What we're saying is we're gonna supersede it with the word of God, with the spirit of God, with the power of God, that his word is working mightily on the inside of us. Well, why don't all of you go head back to your seats. All of you can sit down. Can we give it up for everyone who raised their hand one more time? 